I love it. I love it. Wow. <laughs> I love it. Look at this. This is, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Hey, I'm not surprised. Hey, what's poppin' my homies? What's good? UFC 300, Alex Pereira taking on Jamal Hill. Guys, oh my goodness. Guys, this card, it's a madness. It's a madness. The greatest UFC card of all time. There hasn't been a UFC card better than this. We won't see a UFC card better than this. Guys, there's no reason to miss this card. There's no acceptable reason. You know, if your wife's giving birth, you're streaming it. If you're getting married, you're streaming it. If there's a funeral, the person who died, they would have wanted you to see this card. There's no acceptable reason to miss UFC 300. It's a madness. Pure madness. Now, before we get into the Money City Champions, we look at my bets from last week. As you can see, I was two fighters away from a six for six. And that's pretty cold. Now, Alexander Hernandez. That shouldn't have been a split. Clear loss. Morgan Cherrier. That shouldn't have been a split. Clear loss. But the rest. Look at the rest. You know what I'm saying? Dusting them up. Let's go. Now, if you're somebody that wants my bets... Who I'm personally betting because guys, this is a prediction video. There's no bets on this video. The only way to access my betting tickets is to join the Patreon, get yourself a Money City membership. And the Money City membership is like having a, a golden ticket. But we're not going to no chocolate factory. We're going to the Money City factory. So let's go. Now to look at the Money City champions from last week. If you see your name on the screen, you already know. That's money, pure money. Let's do it again. Now, moving into the first matchup of the card, we've got Davidson Figueredo taking on Cody Garbrandt. Guys, two former champions to start the card. Come on now. Come on now. So, looking at Davidson Figueredo stepping up to Bantamweight in his last fight, he was an underdog against Rob Fon, and he basically dusted up Rob Fon. But then again, Rob Fon, he's kind of got a dusty jaw, and that's why I sided with Davidson Figueredo. And Davidson Figueredo is a karate player. He's going to have like a wide stance right and the right hand if it makes a connection with Cody Garbrandt it's going to set him down now Cody Garbrandt is a very good boxer you know he's quick he's technically very good the only thing we worry about with Cody is his chin you know what I'm saying the chin is made of dust pure dust and he's also really bad with the calf kick defense you know the lead leg of Cody Garbrandt you can target that you can land kicks on that and Davison Figueredo is a good calf kicker you know, the kicks are good, the right hand's good, the hooks are good, the power's good, the jujitsu of Davison Figueredo, it's all good. And it's good with Cody Garbrandt too, you know, the wrestling, the boxing, the speed, the footwork, it's all good. It's just his jaw. His jaw's pure dust. Now, I put some money on Cody Garbrandt against Brian Kelleher because Brian Kelleher, most people didn't mention this, but he was coming off neck surgery, you know, and that was a, a massive red flag. Davison Figueredo, I also predicted as an underdog against Rob Fon because Rob Fon, you know, dusty jaw. This one's difficult. This one's difficult. You know what? Give me Davison Figueredo because I think the calf kicks are going to land early. And I think even if Cody Garbrandt's winning the fight, his chin's dusty. You know what I'm saying? So give me Davison Figueredo. Moving into a matchup between Bobby Green taking on A10 Jim Miller, the legend, the veteran, the guy that's won five of his last six which is a massive achievement for Jim Miller at this stage of his career. Now, guys, Bobby Green, the hands-down style. He's got his hands down. He'll shoulder roll, pop, pop, shoulder roll, pop, pop. You know, he'll do that all night, right? And that's one of the main positives to having the hands down, right? The opponent can't see the punches coming. But, guys, what's the negative to having the hands down? What's the negative? There's no protection for the chin, so you have to get the head movement right. You have to get the shoulder roll right. You have to continue to move your feet, right? Because if you don't and the opponent lands clean, now it looks like Bobby Green against Drew Dober. Now it looks like Bobby Green against Jalen Turner. And Jalen Turner has the physical advantages in terms of speed, you know, very quick, very long and tall. Jim Miller doesn't have that. And Drew Dober's got the ability to stay in the pocket because his Muay Thai is very good. Now, Jim Miller is very tough. But he doesn't really have the ability to stay in the pocket. Jim Miller's more likely to close the distance with hooks and overhands. He's also going to be more likely to bring Bobby Green to the mat. You know, look to use his black belt. Because why would you not? Jim Miller's got a lot of experience on the mat. So if he can take the back of Bobby Green, he's going to do that. But Bobby Green's a good wrestler. He's not a great grappler like Jim Miller. You know, he's not going to be doing jujitsu classes. You know what I'm saying? But Bobby Green can wrestle. And if he can keep the match up on the feet, or if he can at least survive round one, right? Because if Jim Miller's very aggressive in round one, closing the distance with hooks, overhands, trying to get the back of Bobby Green, you know, if he survives round one, Jim Miller's cardio, it's dusty. It's really bad. So it seems to me that 
you know, outside of round one, the hands down shoulder roll style, the jab, the jab's going to be money for King Bobby Green. So give me the King, give me Bobby Green to essentially dust up the veteran. Moving into a matchup between Marina Rodriguez taking on Jessica Andrade. Now guys, Marina Rodriguez, this girl put on the best Muay Thai masterclass I think I've ever seen. And I'm not just saying that, I really believe that. Go back and watch, actually no, I'll put it on the screen for you because I do the work. Look at this Muay Thai masterclass, the knees, the elbows. Every single time she clinched up, you know, there was pure damage in the clinch. The knees, the elbows, that's what Muay Thai is about. You know, you clinch up, who can land the knees, who can land the elbows, who can get the trips to the mat. Marina Rodriguez, the Muay Thai, it's just so good. Now on the flip side, you got Jessica Andrade, the former champion. This girl can box. Her boxing is very effective. It's very dangerous. Do you want to box with Jessica Andrade? Now, Marina Rodriguez, she might just clinch up. You know, she wants to clinch up. If Jessica Andrade tries to put herself in the pocket, that's where Marina's saying, no, 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 come on. I've got the Muay Thai. I've got the Muay Thai. I'll put you in the Muay Thai plum and I'll do what I did to Michelle Watson. Now, is it going to be that easy to, to hold her in the Muay Thai plum and to land damage? Probably not, right? And also, guys, Marina Rodriguez, her takedown defense is really dusty. It's really bad. So if Jessica Andrade goes in there, gets her to the mat, that's a way to win the fight. But I don't think Jessica Andrade is really going to do that. You know, I think she's going to box. And guys, in my opinion, sometimes you just look at the fighter's last performance and you're so amazed by it that you've got to roll with them, right? Marina Rodriguez, the Muay Thai, it was just too good. The Muay Thai clinch, it was too good. Give me Marina Rodriguez to win the fight against the former champion, Jessica Andrade. Moving into a matchup between Jalen Turner taking on Hanato Moicano, and Moicano wants money. Moicano wants money, he's just like us. Now guys, Jalen Turner, the beatdown that he put on Bobby Green, it was good to go. The speed, all of it, right? The boxing, he pieced up, he dusted Bobby Green. And by the way, the ref, the ref, come on now. And here's the thing about Hanato Moicano, his striking defense is really bad. It's really dusty. So if the matchup stays on the feet, expect Jalen Turner to essentially dust up Hanato Moicano. And Moicano's got some good calf kicks. You know, the calf kicks are okay, but it's probably not going to work against Jalen Turner. If he wants to beat Jalen Turner, you've got to get him to the mat. You've got to grapple. You've got to use your jujitsu. And there is a chance that Hanato Moicano can do that because Jalen Turner, his takedown defense, it's kind of dusty. I remember betting Jalen Turner as a massive underdog against Gamrot. And Gamrot's a, a really good wrestler. We all know that, right? And Jalen Turner was going to win that fight. He was close to winning that fight. But the takedown defense, it kind of let him down. Now, Moicano's wrestling isn't as good, right? But if he can get him to the mat, if he somehow gets him to the mat, that's where you're in the world of Moicano. His jiu-jitsu is extremely good. His grappling, much better than the wrestling. However, guys, like I just said on my last breakdown, sometimes you look at the fighter's last performance and you're just so amazed by it that you've got to pick them, right? Jalen Turner, the speed, the speed on the feet is just, it's incredible. And Moicano's defense is incredibly bad. So put those two together. Give me Jalen Turner to dust up Hanato Moicano. I'm a fan of Moicano. He wants money, but I think Jalen Turner gets the win bonus. He gets the money. So give me Jalen Turner, the tarantula, to dust up Hanato Moicano. Now moving into a matchup between Sadiq Youssef taking on Diego Lopez. And guys, Sadiq Youssef essentially got dusted up by Edson Barboza. And by the way, I've seen you guys make some jokes in the comments, right? Every time he says dusted, take a shot. If you do that game, you're going to get wavy. You're going to get essentially dusted, right? And I appreciate you guys for allowing me to spam you with my favorite word. Now, Sadiq Youssef against Edson Barboza. Round one, it looked really good. Round one, it looked like Sadiq Youssef was going to stop Edson Barboza. But Barboza survived. And Barboza's a legend, a veteran, right? He's been there before. So the fight goes into round two. And that's where Barboza starts to work the body of Sadiq Youssef. Some people might say, well, Sadiq Youssef, he kind of got tired. But guys, Edson Barboza made him tired with the body work. He went to the bread basket. So shout out to Edson Barboza. Now, Sadiq Youssef is good. His overall game is pretty good. And on the flip side, Diego Lopez, he put some money in my pocket against Sabatini. And the main reason why he did that, Sabatini's jaw, Sabatini's chin, it's made of dust. And Diego Lopez, this dude, he hits hard. I'm not as confident this time round on Diego Lopez as I was against Pat Sabatini because Sadiq Youssef, the striking's good, right? The chin is better than Sabatini's. 
But if Diego Lopez can connect clean or even get him to the mat, I think he can win the fight. So give me Diego Lopez, the emo Brazilian, to get a nice win over Sadiq Youssef. Let's go Team Brazil. Now moving into a matchup between the Preacher's daughter, Holly Holm, taking on Kayla Harrison. Now guys, I haven't seen a whole lot of Kayla Harrison because I don't really watch Bellator or PFL. But what I do know about Kayla, she's a really good judoka. So if she gets you to the mat, which she probably will, she will get Holly to the mat. She's probably going to dust her up. And I remember listening to Kayla in a few interviews a few years ago talking like, I'm the best. I'm the best. They can all talk the talk, but who's going to walk the walk? Nobody wants to see you're the best at 155. But here she is. She's in the UFC. She's in Bantamweight. And she's going to take on a former champion. However, she's taken on a former champion that is massively past her prime. Now, there's a window. There's a window for all these fighters. And Holly Holm is massively past her prime. And that's why Kayla's going to look really, really good in her UFC debut. Once she gets Holly to the mat, it's ground and pound city. It's get dusted city. So give me Kayla Harrison to look very good in her UFC debut against the preacher's daughter, against somebody that shouldn't be fighting, in my opinion. Now moving into an absolute banger, we've got Calvin Cater taking on Aljamain Sterling. And Aljamain Sterling is going to be moving up to featherweight after getting dusted by Sean O'Malley. And of course, I took Sean O'Malley as a big underdog. Again, people said it would be wrong. It wasn't. I'll continue to do that, right? But here we've got a really good boxer in Calvin Cater, right? His boxing is very good. He did go to Snap City uh, in his last matchup, and that's why he's been away. Now, guys, you want to go to Money City. You want to do that. Snap City, you don't want to go there. And guys, Snap City's round any corner, right? If you go to the gym, you do the exercise wrong. You might go to Snap City. Snap City's around any corner, so be careful. Now, guys, the matchup, Calvin Cater, the boxing, the jab, it's extremely good. So can Aljamain Sterling stand and trade with Calvin Cater? Probably not. However, Aljamain Sterling is an extremely good grappler. His jiu-jitsu, his wrestling, he wants to get Calvin to the mat. The thing is, though, Calvin Cater's takedown defense is pretty good. And even if you get Calvin to the mat, it's difficult to keep him on the mat. I mean, thinking back to Amir Khani against Calvin Cater, Amir Khani spent the whole of round one keeping Cater on the mat. And at the end of that round, he literally had nothing left. Right, just just holding Cater on the mat. That's how much energy it took from Amir Khani. And I know some people might say, well, Amir Khani, the cardio's dusty. And it is, right? But even with Aljamain Sterling, I think if he's made to use that much energy keeping Cater on the mat, we could see the matchup start to play out on the feet. And as we know, Calvin Cater's jab, his boxing, is extremely good. Now, there is some concerns with, you know, going to Snap City, having the time off. There's some concerns there with Cater. But there's also some concerns that there's some concerns that if Aljamain Sterling is made to box, is made to strike with Calvin Cater, we know that Cater's going to piece him up. So in my opinion, give me the underdog, give me Calvin Cater to essentially dust up Aljamain Sterling in his featherweight debut. Now moving into a matchup between Jury Prochaska taking on Alexander Rakic, and this one's a firefight. This one's an absolute war. We've got Jury Prochaska, the former champion, who got dusted by the now champion, Alex Pereira. And he's going to be fighting someone that also went to Snap C, just like Calvin Cater, Alexander Rakic. Now, guys, what made Jury Prochaska a champion? It's the unorthodox striking. You look at his striking and you're thinking, you know, is this guy crazy? This guy's a madman. But as you're looking at that, you're seeing there's mistakes. The chin's in the air, the hands are down, the lead leg is there to be kicked, which Alex Pereira did do that. So you're looking at his striking, and it's kind of a double-edged sword in a way. Yes, there's openings, but there's also the unpredictability. You don't know what's coming next. So you can't really prepare for a guy like Jerry Prochaska. But what you can do is try to find the mistakes, try to find the openings in the fight, which is something that Pereira did. Now, Alexander Rakic, this guy's a monster, Muay Thai monster, and he knows how to wrestle. And also look at the calf kicks of Alexander Rakic. They're some of the best in the division, right? Some of the best calf kicks. And you would expect Rakic to really target the lead leg of Jerry Prochaska, seeing as that was a major weakness in his last fight. However, guys, Alexander Rakic, just like Calvin Cater, he went to Snap C. So the time off is a concern. The injury is a concern. But guys... I kind of think he's too sharp. He's too sharp for someone like Jerry Prochaska. Now, some people might say, well, you know, the time off and the injury, you don't come back and beat Jerry Prochaska. Now, to anyone making that claim, it's not like I can strongly argue against it because, like I said, Jerry Prochaska, he's very dangerous, right? So if he wins the matchup, it wouldn't shock me, but 
Alexander Rakic is a Muay Thai monster and he can wrestle, he can grapple and guys by the way I've got all of Jury's fights right so far from his UFC debut to his title fight got them all right gimme Rakic Bo Nickel versus Cody Brundage guys come on you know this is a mismatch I know this is a mismatch anybody that knows mixed martial arts you know this is a mismatch Bo Nickel has insane wrestling he's gonna fight for a title at some point whereas Cody Brundage this guy would be lucky to be in the UFC like two years from now that's the difference in levels. I would compare this to a shark versus a goldfish. Guys, if you put a shark and a goldfish in the same tank, the shark isn't even worried, right? But the goldfish, for the whole time, is thinking, it's just a matter of time until I get dusted. So that's really what you've got with this matchup. You've got a shark against a goldfish, and that's kind of funny. So not much of a breakdown on this one, guys. More of a statement. We've got a shark against a goldfish. Bone Nickel being the shark. Cody Brundage being a goldfish. So yeah, give me the shark to dust up Cody Brundage. Moving into a matchup between Charlie Oliveira taking on Arman Sarukian. The champion has a name. And it's not Charlie Oliveira, but still, the champion has a name. The best jiu-jitsu player in the UFC. There's not a better grappler, at least when it comes to finishing fights, right? Charlie Oliveira, he's so dangerous, insanely dangerous, and this is a massive test for Arman Sarukian. Now, Charlie Oliveira has improved, right? His striking's improved. The way he set down Justin Gagey, the way he set down Michael Chandler, the way he head kicked Benil Darush. Guys, trust and believe me, this is a massive test for Arman Sarukian. However, Arman Sarukian won a sponsorship at Tiger Muay Thai, and most fighters who win that sponsorship they really dominate in mixed martial arts. And some of them become champions like Alexander Volkanovsky or Peter Yan. Now, Armin Sarukian, his striking is super good, super clean, super damaging. His wrestling, his grappling, it's also very good. His cardio is certainly better than Charlie Oliveira. The only concern I've got is fighting against somebody like Charlie Oliveira, someone that's so dangerous. It's like running into a building that's burning. The likelihood of having it all your own way it's not likely. There's flames to deal with. There's smoke to deal with. There's parts of the building that's going to collapse, right? It's not an easy thing to do. Guys, that's what it's like fighting against Oliveira. You've got to deal with his aggression. You've got to deal with his grappling, his willingness to never die. Sometimes you think you're controlling the flames, but next thing you know, the flames got you in a chokehold. You know what I'm saying? It's like running into a burning building. You think you've got it under control, but it takes one small step the wrong way and everything can go south. So anybody that's gonna bet Charlie Oliveira, I understand. But guys, I've never picked against Arman Sarukian, and I should be undefeated. No way, I picked against Arman in his UFC debut when he fought Islam, but other than that, I've taken Arman in every single matchup. And even in his matchup against Gamrot, guys, if you go listen to my breakdown, I even said at the start of the breakdown, there's gonna be a robbery. And there was, Arman won that fight. Now I'm gonna side with Arman Sarukian to essentially dust up Charles Oliveira, but round one, round one is so dangerous. So, so dangerous. And even in round two, there's still an element of danger, right? We've seen it. We've seen it more than once. But for me personally, I'm going to pick against Charles Oliveira. I think Armand Sarukin gets it done. I think he stops Charles Oliveira in round two. Moving into the BMF title fight, we've got Justin Gagey taking on Max Blessed Holloway. Guys, listen, usually I'll, I'll run through these breakdowns, right? Try to get them done nice and quick. But every now and then, we need a few more minutes. We need a couple more minutes. This is one of them. Now, first of all, I want to give you my history on BMF title fights. In the first BMF title fight, I took Jorge Masvidal. That's 1-0. In the second BMF title fight, I took Justin Gagey. That's 2-0, okay? I'm looking to stay undefeated. That's what I'm trying to do. Now, what we've got here is essentially, we've got a barn burner. We've got pure violence. We've got a, an insane, insane fight. And Justin Gagey is a guy that can chop you down. The calf kicks. The calf kicks are, are so violent. We've seen that for years with Justin Gagey. What we've also seen is his boxing is extremely good. However, Justin Gagey is better now than what he was in 2018, 2019, and even 2020. Back then, Justin Gagey was so reckless, so chaotic, right? And now he's more in control of his chaos, which makes him even more dangerous. For example, you see the way he let Fazeev run into the jab in the final round. Look at the jab of Justin Gagey, round three against Fazeev. It's so composed. It's good stuff, right? You want to see that. Now, guys, what I'm about to tell you with Max Holloway is somewhat of a contradiction. Max Holloway has been in many wars. He's very hittable. He's been hit many times, right? But at the same time, there's times where 
he's very difficult to hit, almost impossible to hit. And that's why it's a contradiction, because someone can't be hittable and impossible to hit at the same time. But that is kind of the case with Max Holloway. For example, if you look at his fight against Calvin Cater, he went into the Matrix, you know, dodging punches. I'm the best boxer in the UFC. He wasn't hittable against Calvin Cater. But then you look at him against Volkanovski, most recently in the trilogy, right? Volkanovski is, is teeing off. He's teeing off all night. And then you look at him against my boy, Arnold Allen, right? Arnie kind of struggled with his range. Couldn't really get the timing. Couldn't really get the range because Max would just move his feet. Max moved his feet so well in that fight. And then you look at him against the Korean Zombie. The overhand right to finish the fight. He creates that with space, right? Moves his feet, creates the space, lands the kill shot. So guys, Max Holloway, at times, very hittable. And also at times, impossible to hit. And that's what makes it kind of difficult to pick this match up. But guys, I believe I've found the answer. I believe I've found the story. What's going to keep me undefeated in BMF title fights. I believe I know the answer. Now guys, this match up, 25 minutes, right? Round one, we're going to see Gagey land the low kick. We're going to see Gagey look very good in round one. And it may continue into round two. But guys, notice how I mentioned to you that Gagey is much better now than what he was in 2018, 2019, 2020. He's not as chaotic. Guess who's going to bring that chaotic Gagey back? The blessed one, Max Holloway. He's going to bring chaotic Gagey back to the cage. And if he does that, guys, it favours Max Holloway. As this fight progresses, we're going to see Gagey return to the old Gagey. And that's my breakdown on this BMF title fight. You know, Gagey's going to look good early. He's more composed. He's better now. But Max Holloway is going to bring back the old Gagey. And when he does, oh boy, oh boy, it's blessed express. It's blessed express. It might be 2-2 going into round five. And like I said, if it turns into a dogfight, which it will, I believe he brings back the old Gagey. And when he does, it's blessed express. Cash money. The prediction is Max Holloway via split decision 48-47 after an absolute war. Let's go. Now moving into the co-main event, we've got Wei Li Zhang taking on Yan. And guys, I'd like to give a little shout out, a little tribute to my old friend Aaron the Dog. I met Aaron in DC a few years ago. We chopped it up, smoked some weed. He's a cool guy, right? And we started this channel together. But then eventually we went our own way and we're not friends anymore. But the dude's a cool guy. And me and Aaron made an agreement. We made a deal and this was six years ago. So Aaron's probably forgot this. I said to Aaron, listen, when Yan fights Zhang, I'm taking Yan. Yan's my pick. And he said to me, no way. I'm taking Zhang. So six years ago, me and Aaron, we already broke down this fight. You know, the matchup was six years away. We didn't know that, right? But we was putting together matchups, speaking about matchups, and we disagreed. We disagreed on this matchup. Now, I'm going to stick with my prediction. And I don't watch Aaron's prediction channel, but I will this week. I will this week. And I hope he picks Zhang, right? So shout out to Aaron, a little tribute on a, a massive card here. Now, guys, Zhang, she's a beast. If she gets Yan to the mat, she should dominate. You see her do that against Lemos. And if she can do that against Lemos, she can do that against Yan. However, if the matchup stays on the feet, I know Zhang's a beast, right? She is a beast, but Yan is okay. Yan is technically pretty good. I wouldn't say she's a plus 400 on the feet. Now, the winner of the co-main event and the winner of the title fight should be Zhang, but yeah, I'm going to side with the big underdog. Give me Yan to win the matchup to shock the world. I'm probably wrong, but yeah, give me Yan. Moving into the main event, we've got Alex Pereira taking on Sweet Dreams, Jamal Hill. The main event is insane. This whole card is insane. Now, guys, if I was to make this breakdown a few days ago, my prediction would be different. It would be different. I've changed my mind on this, on this main event, right? Now, Jamal Hill, the best southpaw striker in the division. That's a fact. His left kick. His left straight. His left-sided weapons. They're super nasty, right? Now, on the flip side, Alex Pereira has the most dangerous, most violent lead hook in the whole of combat. I think most people would agree, right? If you get hit with the, the lead hook of Alex Pereira, it's lights out. Dusted. Game over. Dusted. Now, here's the thing. Jamal Hill, just like Calvin Cater and Alexander Rakic, he went to Snap City. Right, he's been out, he's been injured. So anybody that's thinking, you know, this guy's been injured, he's returning against one of the most violent strikers of all time, the champion, Alex Pereira. If anyone's using that logic, I can't really argue against it too much, right? The logic, it's okay, it's, it's logical. But here's the thing, I've never picked against Jamal Hill. 
From his Contender Series matchup, to his UFC debut, to his loss against Paul Craig, to his return fight as an underdog against Jimmy Crew, to his title fight in Brazil, I've never picked against Sweet Dreams Jamal Hill. I've never done it. His boxing's really good. It's really quick. Technically very good. His IQ, his left kick, his footwork, it's all really good. His grappling's really bad though. You know, the wrestling, the jujitsu, not too good. But Alex Pereira's not going to do that. Pereira wants to strike. And Jamal Hill's going to do that too. So what we've got is a striking matchup, a striking main event for the title. Now something that makes Alex Pereira so dangerous, it is the lead hook, right? And it's also the calf kicks, but also his presence, his presence in the cage. You know, he'll just stay nice and calm. He'll let you make mistakes. He'll let you win rounds, to be honest, because he knows that, you know, this is 25 minutes. The fight's not done in round one. And he knows that if you make the mistake, run into the lead hook. It's game over. And he knows that over time, the calf kicks, they're going to pay off. Guys, something just tells me that the speed of Jamal Hill, the intelligence of Jamal Hill, the ability to box, something tells me Jamal Hill is going to sleep Alex Pereira. And I know that's crazy. That sounds crazy, right? Guys, give me Jamal Hill to do a madness on the main event to send Alex Pereira to the King of Shadow City. Ben Askren. I'm Team Sweet Dreams. That's my pick. As always, guys, drop down your main event, your co-main event, your parlays, your money seed bets, all that good stuff. Drop in the comment section below. And as always, keep your eyes to the sky, never glued to your shoes. Enjoy the best UFC card of all time. Peace. <laughs>